Howdy and welcome to a bevy tutorial on compute shaders. For the past week I've been working on learning how to use compute shaders in bevy. As my learning project I've chosen to do a graphics card accelerated particle system. Mostly because I think it will look cool, but also because I can reference bevy hanabi for anything I can't figure out myself. For this video, I want to have the caveat that I'm not an expert in graphics programming, or in these parts of Bevy. So if a correction is pointed out in the comments, I'll pin that and I'd recommend checking there before taking this video as gospel. I'm still pretty early on in learning all of this myself, but I have a solid result for now and I believe I've worked out enough that it's worth sharing with the community here. As always, the code is linked in the GitHub link in the description and there's an invite to my Discord server if you have any direct questions. I won't be covering everything line by line today, so check the GitHub afterwards to see everything in a working example. First, what is a compute shader? For our purposes, compute shaders are a way to use your GPU for general purpose, highly parallel computing. The GPU is great at many specialized tasks beyond just rendering beautiful graphics, and we want to exploit those powers to make more interesting games and systems. So next up is why even use compute shaders. For that, I'm going to direct you to the Coding Adventure series on Sebastian Wegg's channel. Here he creates many interesting and impressive projects, and many of them depend on compute shaders to be viable. And even though he works in Unity, a lot of the skills will be transferable to WGPU and Bevy. For my project personally, I found this blog on how to do graphics card accelerated particle systems, but it seemed off to use the normal pipeline, where the fragment shader is ignored in this example. It feels more right to me to do the particle updating with a compute shader, so that's what I'm trying to achieve. Also, while looking into Bevy Hanabi's source, it seems to indicate that's exactly what they did for their particle system. I'm going to start from the Bevy example for compute shaders, which does a game of life implementation, and I'll try to expand it into the system I have in mind. This is a complex topic, so I'm going to give a high level overview at the beginning and end of this video. We have a couple of problems. First, we'll talk about using Bevy's render graph to add a step to the rendering flow that will perform our compute shader operations. This will directly lead to implementing a node for the render graph, which will feature a lot of directly manipulating the ECS world, in a way that I often don't cover on this channel. Also in this step, we'll actually dispatch the compute shaders to the graphics card. Next, we need to actually get the buffers set up on the GPU and create the pipelines that let WGPU know what shader functions we want to call and what data we want to share with the GPU. Finally, we'll quick rewrite the compute shaders themselves using WGSL to simulate a basic particle effect. This last step will be pretty minimal just to keep the video reasonable, but in the future this will get a lot more work done to hopefully create some nice flexible particles for our games. First up in main, I'm just going to create a particle spawner component which will hold a handle to the image that we'll render to at the end of this process, and we'll add a particle plugin. I'll create a new texture which will be transparent and importantly be used as a storage by our compute shaders, and as a texture by Bevy when it's time to render it. Now for the meat of our code, let's look at my particle plugin. Here first we want to extract our component. Bevy allows for easy extraction now if we just implement this trait, and all I want to do is copy the handle. Remember, we need to extract components because the main game world and render world are totally separate. Every frame the render world trashes all the components in it and copies the data over from the main world in the extract step. This will be important later on. If you're shaky on the basics of Bevy's render world and stages, here I would recommend the cheat book chapter which explains the basic idea of the extract and queue stages that we'll be working with, and the structure of the render world. Next we'll get the render sub app directly and start adding resources and systems to it. I'll cover these resources when they come up, but importantly again, the render world is 100% separate from the main world and has its own schedule and resources. Now we want to add steps to Bevy's render flow. Specifically, we're trying to add a compute pass into the steps Bevy takes every frame. We do this using Bevy's render graph. There's actually shockingly little information about the render graph systems out there, and that's part of what I wanted to learn more about and cover more in the upcoming weeks. Thankfully, there is a plugin that can print out the render graph for us so we can see exactly what's going on in Bevy by default. This plugin can also print out your system schedules into a nice view, so I think this is a really good find and I'll totally be adding it to my own debugging toolkit. The important thing here is the graph is an acyclic directed graph which forces each node to run before the nodes they are connected to. To add nodes to the render graph, we need to do a couple of things. First we need to actually get the graph, which is a resource in the render app. Then we need to add a node. 
which needs the name of the node, which unfortunately needs to be a string in this version of Bevy. And finally, we need something that implements node. We'll come back to implementing node in a few minutes, but for now trust me that I have created an update particle node that we can add to the graph. Then, to actually make this node run at the correct time, we add an edge from our node into the camera driver, forcing our node to run before the camera driver node, which seems like the correct step to me. Great, so now we have Bevy trying to run our node, so let's actually talk about what it means to be a node. To implement node, we need to have a run function defined. Practically for us, we're also going to add an update function as well. We need to implement update because it's the only function here that gives us mutable access to the node itself, and we'll want to have some state we want to save. Just a quick aside because it's important throughout this video. World is literally the entire ECS state. When we have mutable access to it, nothing else will be running, and it is the most powerful thing we can get from Bevy. We can get any resources and create queries using it, and this is how we'll achieve most of our goals today. Also note that nodes can have slots, which allow for data transfer between nodes. These can be connected when we were modifying the graph and allow for buffers, textures, and even a specific entity reference to be sent between nodes. Personally, I didn't find a need for this, but it's important to be aware of. To get the slot data in the run function, you want to look into the render graph context you're past. For our node specifically, we're going to have two pieces of data. First, we want to keep the state of each of our particle spawners. I would love to have this as part of the spawners component, but because we want to write to this state and the render world flushes components every frame, we need to save it here. I really couldn't find any way to copy the data back to the main world to preserve it. So get used to seeing this janky hash map of entities to data we want to preserve. There's probably a better way, I just don't know it yet. Our state here is just if we're waiting for the GPU to start up, running the first frame initialization, or if we're in our steady state updating passes. We also want to store a query state, and this is what we'll need to be able to iterate over a query while running the node. A query state is a bit of a nebulous topic in the bevy docs, but as I understand it, it is a part of the query strut and it's used extensively within the query's implementation. Specifically for us, it allows us to use our queries while providing the world when it's time to iterate. If we just try to hold a query in our node, we'll get lifetime issues where the node needs to live as long as the world and probably a bunch of other issues. One important note is that just iterating a query state needs mutable access, which we'll run up against soon. Now to actually implement our node, let's start with the optional update function. Here we can mutate the node and the world so we have a lot of power. Our main goal is to update the state of each of our spawner entities, so let's make a helper function to do that. Here, if an entity isn't in our hash map of states, then we'll add it and default it to the loading state. Then for each state, we'll see if we're ready to move on to the next step for this entity. Specifically, we want to check if the next stage's pipeline is loaded. When we set up the pipelines later, we'll see that we just queue up the loading and the graphics card may take some time to actually load our compute shader. This seems to be pretty common, as the GPU is a separate machine, and therefore much of what we want to do will be async, and we're just queuing up things for the GPU to do when it's ready. Our states here are the same as the Game of Life example, where we want to set up our particles at an initial starting state for one frame, and then we want to run a different shader which will handle updating the particles. The pipelines we'll be getting here are stored as lightweight cached ID values, and we'll keep those in a particle update pipeline resource. Here we also keep our bind group layout just for easy use later. We'll come back to initializing this once we're done implementing the node. Now back in our update function, we can get this resource and the pipeline cache, and then run update state for every one of our spawners. When we are writing run, we won't have the ability to mutate ourselves or the world. This is a problem because remember our query state, which we want to use to iterate over entities and run, requires mutable access to iterate. Thankfully, we have a backdoor function called iteramanual. This will let us iterate without mutating the query or the world. It just has one caveat where we have to manually update the archetypes before iterating. Discussion about what archetypes are is a topic for a completely separate series, but for now, let's just call the update archetypes function in our update and be happy knowing that it keeps the query up to date and ready to iterate in the next step. Now in run, we can finally do what we're trying to accomplish and run our compute shaders. Here, we can iterate using the iter manual function we set up, 
and depending on the state, we'll get the correct pipeline ID and call a helper function to run a compute pass. Here in the helper function, we need to get a command encoder from the render context and call begin compute pass. As I understand it, the command encoder just lets us set up some steps that we want the GPU to do, and then we'll submit it as a job to the GPU. This is starting to get into learn WGPU territory, so I'll leave the explanation at that level for this video. Then for our pass, we just want to set our bind groups, which we'll create soon, and we want to set the pipeline to the one that we get from our ID. Finally, let's call dispatch workgroups to actually force the GPU to run our shaders. For now, let's table the discussion of what workgroups are until we have our bind groups and shaders set up. The basic idea is that we're sending jobs to the GPU to run in batches of a fixed size. This is the end of our node implementation, but we still have many things to cover. Notably, I made another resource here, which is again a hash map from entities to various things, which I would like to write to in the render world and have preserved. Here is the bind groups and the buffers which will hold the particle data. It's worth noting that when I first did this, I did it for a single resource, and then I went back to expand it to work for as many entities as I wanted, so that we can have many spawners. The Game of Life example takes a different approach and everything is done through resources, so it only supports a single Game of Life running. Things are much simpler when you're just trying to run on a resource, but I don't find that as practical and you miss all of the details of dealing with queries in these situations. So we've now set up our node to run before the camera, and it will dispatch the compute shaders using our pipelines. But we haven't even made a pipeline, so let's do that next. Remember the particle update pipeline resource that held the pipeline IDs? It's time to initialize that resource. Here, we're going to use a from world implementation, which lets us create a resource using anything in the ECS world. Specifically here, that'll be the render world. First, let's handle the easy thing. We need to save a bind group layout that we'll use in the future. Remember from our past shader work that bind groups control how we get data onto the graphics card, and we need a layout in the actual bind group, and these must always be in sync. For this reason, I'm defining both in a helper functions near each other in my source code, so I can easily check that both are in the same format. For this bind group, we just want to store the buffer, which will hold all of our particle data for now. In the future, we'll probably want to have other things like time and position passed as uniforms, but for today it's just a buffer. Importantly, it's a storage buffer that is not read-only, so our shader can write the updated particle values. Now let's make the pipelines. Let's create a shader handle by loading a WGSL file from our assets. I'll come back to what's in here in a little bit, but trust me it's two shader functions called init and update. Then, we'll get the pipeline cache we were using back in Node. This just lets Bevy keep the pipelines around and we can reference them by IDs, just like the handle system for assets. Now all we need to do is call QComputePipeline and give it a pipeline descriptor. Again, for code cleanliness, I'll make these in a helper function, but all that matters is they need to know the shader function to call and the bind group layouts. Notice that this function is called QComputeShader, so it's not instantly ready. We are just asking WGPU to get one ready, and that's why we need to all the state management stuff earlier, so we can know for sure that the pipeline is ready before we dispatch our work groups. The very last Rust function we need to talk about is QBindGroup. In our plugin description, we added this as a system to the Q step of the render app, and this will handle making sure our buffer actually exists on the graphics card so we can write to it. Here's where we want to set up our particle system render resource, which remember is just a hash map from the entities to the bind groups and buffers that make sure we keep one for each spawner entity. I'm going to lazily create the buffer so it's only created once and only if the entity is not in the hash map. To create the buffer, we create a bunch of particles which are just going to be position values for this example. Notice it derives shader type. Now we need to format the particle strut array into a sequence of bytes in the format that the GPU expects. For this we use incase, and we write the array into one of its buffers. This requires the shader type derived so it can know how to format the strut. Then let's call create buffer with data and give it our particle array. We could initialize the particle data here if we wanted, instead of using an init compute shader, and that might be a better option in the future. I honestly don't know. Importantly, I tried using Bevy's helper storage buffer strut, but I found that I could not customize the usage flags, 
and I wanted my buffer to be a copy source so I could copy it back from the GPU and inspect it while debugging. If I could change these flags, then I would much rather be using the nice abstraction here. Also, quickly let's talk about reading buffers back from the GPU. I really couldn't find a way I love to do this after reading everything I could understand in Bevy's help channels in the WGPU examples. I ended up with this function, which creates a new buffer, which has the map read usage flag and the copy destination flag. Then I do a copy buffer to buffer, which is why we need the copy source flag on the main buffer. Then we submit the command to force WGPU to perform the copy, and then we map this buffer to a slice, which is why we need the map usage flag. And finally, call device.pull to wait for the copy to be complete. Now we can just print the results as a byte vector, and this was good enough for my early debugging. I'm mostly showing this because a common thing to do with a compute shader will be to read it back to the CPU. But again, I would still be vague on how to actually get this data all the way back to the main world to use in gameplay. I'm sure this channel exists, but for now it escapes me. Back in QBind groups again, I'm just going to do a lazy instantiation to create the bind groups if they're not already in the hash maps. Using a helper function here again lets me keep the bind group and its layout functions right next to each other when I need to update them. The bind groups just needs to bind the entire buffer that we created a minute ago. Now I'm going to duplicate everything we have so far to create another node for the rendering pass. This way I can have one node that creates and updates the particles, and another one that renders them. I'll make a new bind group and layout, except here I also want to bind the texture that we made for the spawner and write to that. I also need a compute pass to clear the texture every frame. I tried creating a new texture every frame, but that performed horribly. There might be an easier way to wipe the texture, but in my test just making a compute shader that stores a transparent pixel to the entire image seems to perform just fine. Of course, I'm also going to cache every resource I need, just like I did for the update node, and I'll add this to the render graph after update and before the camera. Possibly I could abstract something away here to really cut down on the duplication, but this is already a complex enough process, so I'm fine with this level of abstraction. We are finally ready to talk about the actual shaders now. Unfortunately, I'm at my limit for this video, so let's just quickly set them up and then we can expand the behavior in the future. For the updating shader, we just need to create our particle strut and set up the arrays that will be where our bind group buffers attach. Now in init, which we set as one of our entry points, we just want to use the random functions from the game of life shader to randomly position particles around. Note the work group size here. I'm a bit vague as everyone else seems to be on how to pick these numbers, but they must line up with the numbers that we used when we called dispatch work groups. Basically this says that we're running the shader function in batches of 16 and these will all be run in parallel. We can get the exact ID number of this batch from the global invocation ID, and it's important to be careful that we don't overrun the particles array. When we dispatched the workgroups, we dispatched our particle counts divided by the workgroup size, so each ID number here should be one particle in our array. There are also dynamic buffers, but those don't seem to be offered on every GPU and already have enough complexity for this project. Unfortunately, this does mean I think the number 16 must be kept in sync with the number in the Rust code, and that the particle strut must also line up with the Rust version. I wish there was an easy way to get this from Bevy, but I haven't found it yet. Our update function will be basically the same thing, but we'll get the current position and add one to the y value as a quick janky gravity. Obviously, we'll come back to this in the future to add more features. Specifically, spawning particles over time, which from looking at Bevy Hanabi's code, it seems like I'll need to learn and use the atomics in WGSL, so that sounds like it's going to be fun. For the rendering shader, we need a clear function. This will be called first and is simply storing a blank pixel to the texture. Then, for the main rendering shader, I'll just draw a quick star pattern for each particle. It's good to know that this doesn't have any of the safety checks you might be used to in Rust. Here, if two work groups try to write the same location, then it's just a race condition, and accessing out of bounds seems to just stop that pass immediately, with no warning or printout. All of these are problems that I'm sure we'll face as we go on, but for now, I think we can be done. So at the end of the day, we have some deterministic particles falling at a constant speed. And I can press space to create more instances of these exact same set of particles.
It's not the most exciting result, but we've learned a lot of powerful systems that we can hopefully leverage to make beautiful things going forward. In my profiling test, this seems to support over 500 spawners on my graphics card, and each one can have thousands of particles, so that's more than enough for my use cases. My biggest open question to the community at large is how to move data back from the render world to the main world, and I hope that next time I'm able to make all of this a bit more idiomatic using that technique. In review, we set up the bevy render graph to add our two new steps. We created a node implementation that runs a state machine and actually dispatches our compute traders. We created the compute pipelines, the buffers, and the bind groups using from world resources and the queue bind group system. Finally, we wrote four compute trader functions which share data and write to a texture we can see in the game. Overall, I'm pretty happy with everything we managed to cover, and I hope you learned a bit more about how rendering works in Bevy. As always, please remember to like and subscribe, and a massive thank you to my Patreons, who really make deep dives like this possible for me. This video is a massive endeavor, and I really appreciate the support. Thank you for watching.